I didn't expect this kind of a party in a gala. What an opportunity, an excellent opportunity to be with you here today, and uh, I appreciate it. I look forward to visiting with each one of you, and right off the bat, the, in the first question I have to answer, which I've answered quite a few times already, but it would be wise for me just to start and let everybody know, because you figured out that I spend about 170 nights each year in hotel rooms, and yet... As Simon just introduced me as a sixth generation farmer, rancher, I don't care, Dominique, you don't get hung up on that. You can call me whatever you want. But the, the first question that everybody always wants to know is, well, how big can your ranch be if you're never there? <laughs> so I think this is what Michael Moore and I have in common, actually. It's just as big as my wife can handle. <laughs> We're in, Phoebe. We're good. <laughs> you know, it... it it's an interesting time when we live in the information age and people have, you have on your hip, in your pocket, or maybe you're Googling as we speak, access to more information than could have ever been imagined. And yet there is a greater disconnect in not only food production, but the essentials of life that everybody relies on, and yet they don't have the accurate information, or they have bad information. And many people just don't care. And one of the educations that I had to really go through to, to start to figure out how to even communicate about what I thought was important in producing food to the consuming public globally was to understand how much they don't know and have no clue. I'm an individual that drinks a lot of coffee. It took us forever to get here because Simon had to stop at every service center between Geelong and here, and we made it. But in the United States, all of our coffee, or our coffee in gas stations is much different. And uh, they got this, they put this lid on there, and it's got this little flippy thing on it, Tony, and you tip that up, and that little flippy thing sticks in your nose, and you spill coffee on your pants, you wonder why'd I get the lid? <laughs> so I go lidless. And I'm in this gas station, La Crosse, Wisconsin, not that long ago, it's right on the Mississippi River, and I walk up to the counter, and I put my lidless cup of coffee down in front of a young lady much older than you. She's at least 50, old enough to know better. She looks at my lidless cup of coffee and she says, is that coffee? No, it's water. Oh, you smart ass, our water looks like that here in La Crosse some days. <laughs> and then for no reason whatsoever, the guy right behind me in line, he pipes up and he says, yes, yeah, because the fish have sex in the water. So I turned to him and I said, is there water that fish don't have sex in? <laughs> Once again, the young lady behind the counter says, you guys quit pulling my leg. Fish don't have sex. <laughs> How is it that we get more fish? Oh, I never thought about that. She lives 100 feet from the Mississippi River where fish are having sex on a daily basis, making more fish, and she never thought about it. And here's the kicker. What is it that we always say when we come to meetings involving agriculture and education? We always just say, well, we just need to educate her. How do you educate someone that doesn't understand the first thing about the cycle of life? And the challenge that I contend that we all have today in the business of food production is that not only ladies selling coffee in gas stations, regulators, school teachers, insurance salesmen, even the occupants of our current White House do not understand the basic premise about the cycle of life, and that is everything lives, everything dies, and death with a purpose gives full meaning to life. And the fundamental disconnect between understanding that and not getting how everything does die. And what we do in agriculture is that we manage the life, we create the death, so that we can in turn improve another living thing. That's how it works. And we do it more efficiently and better today than any of our ancestors. We have taken the efficiencies and we are producing more with less. The problem is that in agriculture we've been trying to become what? More efficient. And we have. We have become tremendously more efficient. Today it requires a half an acre of land to produce enough food to feed a person for one year. 100 years ago, it required five acres of land. When we talk about meeting the demand for the global population of 9.4 billion people by 2050 or whatever it's going to be, it will require that we produce more with less. 
and the most famous and the, the most important American agricultural person that ever walked the planet was a farm boy from Iowa by the name of Dr. Norman Borlaug. Dr. Borlaug went to developing countries around the world and took hybrid wheat. And he found a way through the Green Revolution to allow people to teach them to grow food and feed their nations to improve the health of people. And he was granted in 1988 the Nobel Peace Prize. And then he was asked to come back and give the keynote address at the Nobel Peace Prize in 2000. And he said during his keynote address that there is no doubt farmers with the technology that they currently have and the technology that's in the research pipelines will have no problem feeding 10 billion people on this planet. The challenge comes in will they be allowed to utilize the very technology that we have access to. And that's where we stand today. Not understanding the cycle of life, not understanding the basic things, and as Simon said, we do now have thousands of people globally that want to be better advocates for food production and really every segment of life in the world. But one of those other lessons that I learned pretty quick is that we in farm com communities don't even speak in a lingo and a language that the non-farm person understands. We have 100, 100 beef cattle, we have 40 sows, we have 35 horses, and we have 70 meat goats at the house. And since January 1, we have had 37 kids. I was on the phone in Dallas, Texas, at the airport the other day. I was talking to somebody and they asked me something about how kidding was going. And so I said, well, it's going great. We've had 37 kids born since the first of the year at the house. <laughs> when I hung up the phone, the lady asked me what in the d devil is going on at my house that my wife could have 37 kids. <laughs> and I didn't even think about that. You know, we say things like that all the time. And then I started thinking about all of the times that I've been on the phone and I'm calling home, checking with Kelly to see how things are going, and I'm, bulls got out, and I'll just blurt out in the middle of an airport, I knew we should have castrated those guys last week. <laughs> it never goes well in an airport. People are like, whoa, what's going on with this guy? And then I'm speaking in Albuquerque, New Mexico, oh, it was last April, actually, and it was a Southwest region meeting. There's 300 women who want to be better advocates for agriculture, and the night before, we have this welcome reception. I'm sitting visiting with Paula, Paul and her husband raised bell peppers about 100 miles south of Albuquerque, and she said, oh, April's really our busy time of the year. We just hired 20 new whores last week. <laughs> I said, you did what? <laughs> she said, you know, 20 people to hoe a row. Said, oh, my goodness. I called Kelly right away, and I said, Kelly, we got to start raising bell peppers. This is the best conversation I've never had in an airport. <laughs> we, we don't speak in a language that non-farm folks can relate to. And we've got to think about that. And think about, I talked about efficiency and what Norman Borlaug was talking about. What is the thing that every marketing food entity wants today? Their, their food has to be green. Well, what's more green than efficient farming and food production? But we've been calling it efficient. They want green, and they don't know it's the same thing. Because we did not position it correctly. I can give you the numbers from the United States off the top of my head. In 1945, we had 24 million dairy cows in the United States. Today, we have 8.9 million dairy cows, and we produce three times the total amount of milk that we had with one -third, two thirds more cows in 1945. We have the same exact number of beef animals, breeding beef animals, that we had in 1951, Peter. And in 2013, we produced three times as much beef as we did in 1951 with the same exact number of beef animals. Because we found a way to be more efficient, we found a way to produce more with less. And by the way, we did not accomplish that with some government mandate and some third party audit saying, oh, this is the best and most sustainable way to produce the food. We accomplished it because the people closest to the land had a desire to be better. And right now, I'm fully aware of what's going on. I was here, actually speaking in Toowoomba, as your government was talking about imposing this new carbon tax on energy and agriculture in Australia. And it just so happened that I was speaking that week, and the lady, by the time I got done speaking, had wished this damn Yankee had never gotten off the plane 
because he fired up 300 cattle feeders in Queensland about how ridiculous this carbon tax was. Why was it ridiculous? Here's why. And you probably don't even know this. Do you know that your carbon tax is formulated on a United Nations model put together by a, g a guy by the name of Dr. Peter Gerber from Germany? <coughs> that came as a result of the 2007 look at how food production is impacting climate change. What you don't know is that in 2009, after Frank Mitlerner from University of California Davis challenged Peter Gerber because he looked at his formula and he said, you know that your model is flawed, right? Because here's what it did. It took the entire carbon life cycle of food, planting the food, harvesting the food, producing the food, transporting the food, manufacturing the food, taking it to the store, and even included the consumer driving to the grocery store and buying the food. 18% of all greenhouse gases come from food production according to that model. What they put in the formula for ag or energy and oil was what the carbon greenhouse gas emissions were from the time the oil was taken out of the soil to the gas station. That's it. Complete whole life cycle on food production, one little piece of energy. Dr. Pierre, Peter Gerber actually said, you're right, we made a mistake. The model is flawed. I shared that to 300 cattle feeders in Toowoomba. The lady behind me representing Australian Carbon Tax Implementation 101 actually said, we know the model is flawed, but it looks like a nice place to start. <laughs> Consequently, you have had a hurdle placed in front of you in doing what it is that Australia do does, and that is take the two God-given natural resources, food production and resources and minerals, and pr provide them to the world that needs them for the essentials of life, food, fiber, pharmaceuticals, and fuel. And these, I don't need to tell you about the hurdles. You know all about them. But we've got to start standing up and making sure that these decisions are based upon science and people get a grasp. Airplanes are like my mental playground of gymnastics. I mean, I get to interact with people from every walk of life. And it is very easy. I've already heard several times somebody talk about organic. You know, organic is fine. Do you know that E. coli 15787 is organic? Not all organic things are great, okay? But I will be, get in this conversation. This Typically, it's a lady sitting next to me, and she's wanting to know where I'm going and all of these other questions. And I talk about that I'm actually going to a meeting to speak to a group of farmers because we need to do a better job improving the image of farmers around the world. And that lady or man, either one, will pause and they'll say, well, is there an image problem for farmers? I, I love farmers. And before we finish our conversation, that person will have figured out that everything they thought about farmers was wrong. Because the person, the average citizen in Melbourne, when they think about a farmer, what do they think of? Plaid shirt, straw hat, piece of straw sticking out of the mouth, right? Yesteryear in food production. And if you were to talk about genetically modified organisms, oh my goodness, the devil has found a way to get us all. <laughs> I, I, and and she'll, inevitably, she'll always say, well, I don't like chemicals. I only eat organic food. While she is drinking a high latte Starbucks coffee that she got just before she got on the plane. Do you know what caffeine is? Does anybody know? It's actually a pesticide. It's a pesticide that the coffee plant produces to protect itself from insects. And if you do not harvest coffee beans from the coffee plant, the coffee plant will actually produce enough of this pesticide to kill itself. I don't have a problem with caffeine. I already told you, drink a lot of caffeine. But you can't be drinking copious amounts of caffeine and tell me that chemicals are bad. <laughs> caffeine is the most consumed chemical in the world. And chemicals have improved lives. What we need to make sure that we do is have a moderate amount of all chemicals, including this one. This was a, I had a lot of fun with this, but it really showed me how the psyche of the human being works. I got this young lady, gave her a clipboard. We went to the Farm Progress Show. It happened to be in Illinois that year. Farm Progress Show is where 
it's a farmer event, and farmers come from all over the country, and they look at new tillage equipment, and they look at all of these things that could be accomplished, and I got this camera, and I did like a secret hidden camera interview thing, and I had this young lady go up to 46 farmers at the Farm Progress Show, and her story was that we have recently determined through testing that there is a chemical found in all food now, very prevalent in baby food. It is in all streams. It is called dihydrogen monoxide. This chemical needs to be banned, and we were asking you to sign this petition to send to the FDA to ban this dangerous chemical, dihydrogen monoxide. Of the 46 farmers she asked to sign that petition, how many do you think signed it? 41. Who wants to tell me what dihydrogen monoxide is? H2O. 41 out of 46 farmers signed a petition to ban dihydrogen monoxide. It has nothing to do with how shiny the young lady was that asked him the question. It has everything to do with how we just want, oh, we just, this is our human nature to fall into these traps and think that chemicals are bad. And if there's something wrong, we want to stand up. The other conversation, you cannot believe this. I'm a complete stranger with all of these people on airplanes. And yet, every single time I'm in an airport or on an airplane, I get in conversation about hormones. The other day, I'm walking through Denver International Airport just minding my own business. I'm just walking through there. These three ladies, who was over here doubting that I could mind my own business? <laughs> These three ladies who later I learned had gotten on a plane to Los Angeles, they're flying to Boston, and they're pretty lubed up by the time they got to Denver, all right? They're feeling pretty good, and they holler, hey, cowboy! Well, I always want to be a gentleman, so I felt inclined to go say hi. <laughs> First question's always the same. Are you a real cowboy? Well, ma'am, it depends on your definition of a real cowboy. Mine happens to be anyone who is willing to follow the spirit that resides within themselves to see a task to completion. And then, willing to accept the responsibility of the end result. If that's your definition, then yes, I qualify. Whatever. What I really wanted to know <laughs> is what are you cattlemen putting in the nation's beef supplies causing these young girls to reach puberty at earlier ages? Oh, I am so glad you asked me about that. <laughs> because you see, our young girls are reaching puberty 18 months before their mothers. 24 months before their grandmothers. But I'm curious, ma'am, do you know what hormone we use in the beef industry? No, we call it estrogen. Oh, you can see little lights are beginning to flicker in her head because she's thinking, wait a minute. I have estrogen. Yes, ma'am. In fact, what I want you to know is if you're to take a piece of beef, three ounce serving of, say, grass fed, natural, organic, never had any additional estrogen added to the life of that growing animal, that three ounce serving of beef will have 1.39 nanograms of estrogen. The same three ounce serving of beef from a conventionally produced steer that's had two administered doses of estrogen in the growing phase will have 1.89 nanograms of estrogen. So 1.39 compared to 1.89, is that statistically significant? Wait, the average garden salad that you ate before you worried about the hormones in the beef supply? 1,200 nanograms of estrogen. One cabbage leaf? 2,000 nanograms of estrogen. A tablespoon of soybean oil? 28,000 nanograms of estrogen. And ma'am, you're not on birth control pills, are you? <laughs> Why would you answer that question? It was just rhetorical. <laughs> the average birth control pill has 34,000 nanograms of estrogen. So you can see why I'm a little bit frustrated that you're worried about the hormones in the beef supply and you're putting 34,000 times that same hormone in your mouth every single day and you didn't even know it. And depending on how the conversation is going at this point, I might then ask, <laughs> you don't know where we get that natural estrogen we put in those pills, do you, ma'am? No. Oh, this is cool. We take these pregnant horses, we collect their urine, then we separate the estrogen out of the urine, we put it in a pail, and you put it in your mouth. Isn't that neat? <laughs> that's about time she'll say, oh, that's my plane, I gotta go. <laughs> wait, ma'am, wait, there's more. Guess what? 27 countries 
across the pond. We call them the EU. They have the same concern that you do about adulterated food. No country in the world can send beef to the EU if you've ever used any of that nasty estrogen implant. They don't allow their dairymen to use recumbent bovine somatotropin. They don't even allow their crop producers to use biotechnology and crop production. And guess what? Girls in the European Union are reaching puberty. 18 months before their mothers, 24 months before their grandmothers. How can this phenomenon be occurring? I'm lumping them all in as one country. One, two countries with such vastly differing views on the adaptation of science and technology, and yet they have the same exact phenomenon occurring. How can that happen? I'll tell you how. They have not had enough global soccer moms that have ever developed a group of breeding heifers. All right? Anybody ever developed a group of breeding heifers? Don Larson, sounds like a good time for you to pipe up. <laughs> Did you say yes? No, you're good. I'm going to have some questions for you. Don, if you want those heifers to reach puberty early in life and calve by the time they're, say, 24 months of age, what's the first and most important thing you must do to a heifer, Don? And don't tell me to be gardener genetics or I'm going to come over there and get on you. What you got to do? You said it right. Feed them. You have to have those heifers at a high enough percentage of body fat the day we introduce a hormone. Because you see, in cattle or humans, the hormone receptors reside in the body fat. And if there's not enough body fat, they're not going to respond the day they're introduced to a hormone. In the beef industry, we introduce a hormone one of two ways. We either administer a prostaglandin or we simply run a bull in the pen next to the heifers. Either way, if and only if those heifers are at a high enough percentage of body fat, they will reach puberty earlier in life. Okay, Don, questions are getting easier from here on out. <laughs> Our young girls today in the United States and Australia, are they at a higher or lower percentage of body fat than they were a generation ago? <laughs> higher, he said. Without reservation, he said higher. It's no, no question about it. It's documented. Don, final thing. Our young girls today, do they have more or less access to sex on televisions, iPods, Nookies, Wookies, and Wii than they did a generation ago? <laughs> what was your answer? <laughs> this is not about picking on your brother the Kiwi. Let's get it on. And without a doubt, network television said, 77% of all primetime television shows now contain strong sexual content. So, Don Larson, if our young girls have a higher percentage of body fat than they did a generation ago, and they have more access to sex on televisions, iPods, Nookies, Wookies, and Wii, why are they reaching puberty 18 months before their mothers? Exactly right. They're just like a heifer. But I would be careful, Don, where you run around telling people that in an airport because a complete stranger might not understand it, all right? You better take a pair of fast shoes. It's basic science. It's understanding how. And I see this table of young ladies firing up, ready to come up here afterwards and say, okay, Trent, that kind of makes sense about the girls, but what about the boys? I'm convinced since the beginning of time when the doctor slapped the baby's butt and said it was a boy, puberty began, and I don't see dietary changes ever affecting that, okay? <laughs> this is where we're at. We live in a, in a world where food in the developed countries is so affordable that we have to find something to blame. It used to be that we would have to burn massive amounts of calories in order to find our food. Today, we don't do anything. We don't even turn that key on our car anymore. We stand in the house, and we hit the button, and we wait for it to warm up until we go, oh, wait, you don't have cold cars. Never mind. 12 below ze zero Celsius in my house yesterday. That's what we do at home. We don't, but that's what people do. We don't burn the calories, Peter, like we once did. Healthy living. We have both. I read articles uh, and watched a video on the on plane coming over about the truth about fat, why our nations are getting fat. And they're trying to find some complex formula. They're trying to find some hormone. I can fix it all right here. They're eating more than they're exercising. It's pretty simple. 
healthy living is this simple. And it's never going to be a million dollar item to sell on TV because it's this. Eat a moderate amount of all food groups, exercise more than you eat. That's it. It's that simple. We've gone so far away from common sense. And we want to demonize genetically modified foods. We want to demonize potatoes. The United States Department of Agriculture actually pulled white potatoes out of the food welfare program because kids are getting fat. It's not the white potato, it's the couch potato that's causing the kid to get fat. <laughs> it's basic common sense. I want to get back to the EU because there's one thing that I see you and we are trying to both as countries follow the EU and their flawed food policy. In 1997, 20% of the food consumed in the EU was imported from other countries. In 2013, 64% of the food consumed in the EU was imported from other countries. And their cost per capita since 1997 has increased by 33%. So the next time you hear somebody in Parliament talking about, well, we need to implement this animal welfare strategy because the EU did it. We need to get those chickens out of the cage because the EU did it. We need to get those sows out of the gestation stalls, which I know you're too far down the path on that already, because the EU did it. We need to stop using antibiotics in food and animal agriculture because the EU did it. Remind them that the EU is on a path of starvation. I spoke in Dublin, Ireland in October and shared that same message. And a third of the farmers in the EU came up to me and they said, you need to be louder and you need to talk longer because they don't get it. 12,000 pork producers have gone out of business in the past three years in the EU due to overzealous regulations. We're regulating ourselves out of business. Meanwhile, we have a growing number of people that need access to the essentials of life. Food, fiber, pharmaceuticals, and fuel. And one of the reasons, I want to get back to my obesity and overweight issue that I think we really all need to hone in on, is that I went to the Pennsylvania Farm Show first week of the year. And at this Pennsylvania Farm Show, they have 600,000 people come in and we built a modern confined barn, just like the barns we have chickens in, the barns we have pigs in, veal calves in, dairy freestyle barn. And you walk in this barn, the first thing you see on the left is 50 chickens in a cage literally laying eggs. On the right, you got four veal calves and stanchions, just like they would in a veal barn. Next on the right, you got a, a dairy freestyle barn, like we have, and I found two this week in Victoria where the cattle are inside all of the time and complete with a back scratcher. I'm convinced to it. If there is such a thing as reincarnation, I want to come back as a dairy cow because nobody's got it better. On the left side of the barn, we got ducks in like a hatchery. Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania are duck farming states. And then we have got um, sows in a gestation stalls, two gestation stalls. We've got pigs in like a nursery. In the end pen, we've got a couple pigs in what would be just like a finisher barn. On the last pen on the right side is an, a cow-calf pair, an Angus cow-calf pair. Hanging on that pen are eight feed bins that we feed cattle, and particularly Pennsylvania. Ground corn, ground alfalfa, soybean meal, some other forages, and then there were two bins that had some Hershey product, because just down the road in Hershey, Pennsylvania, is a Hershey you know all about that, all right? Well, the byproduct gets fed to cattle. And then in York, Pennsylvania, just down the road a little farther, is a Frito-Lay plant. So you have some byproduct of corn chips and things like that that we feed to cattle. So I'm spending four days at the Pennsylvania Farm Show, and I didn't talk to every person, but as they walk in this barn and see those chickens laying eggs in the cages and veal calves in these stalls and sows in gestation stalls, what do you think the most commonly expressed concern I heard were there for four days? What? You're feeding my cattle candy bars and chips? And it was a light bulb moment. The reason that so many people in the world have a health problem is because they've been taught to demonize food instead of understand nutrition. There's nothing wrong with eating candy bars and chips if you burn more calories than you consume. But our medical community continues to talk about, you need to eliminate milk, meat, or eggs from your diet. The science says that you must. In fact, the science says that kids who eat meat every day for breakfast 
kids are, have score much higher on IQ tests. The science says that, and I'm going to take my hat off to Australia, and I sent this message yesterday at the dairy conference because your per capita of whole milk has not changed since 1970. It's 106 liters. And that's important, and I say whole fat. You In your stores, you call it full cream. I went to Kohl's in Geelong. I wanted to see it for myself. The benefit of full fat milk, and we're missing the boat. In the United States, the United States consumer in 1945 consumed 64 gallon per year of whole milk. We consumed eight last year. And oh, by the way, all medical outlets provi are, are re now reporting that we have the poorest bone health our nation has ever seen with young people. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to put two and two together. The difference between your, whole, your full fat milk and your low fat milk is it still has the conjugated linoleic acid in it. When you separate the milk and you remove and you drink 2%, they've taken the good fat, put it in the ice cream, and you get what's left. And we've been duped into that poor nutritional advice in the United States, and you've not here. And that, by the way, is why I believe you still consume 106 liters of milk a year because it's healthy for you, it tastes better, and there, it's doing wonderful things, particularly to brain function. Meat is documented. There's a tremendous study that just came out of Germany, and I've been telling this story. Do you know who the most frequently, um, demographics, I'm gonna win all friends with women today I can tell. Demographically, who is the most frequently clinically depressed in the world? White, affluent women that are well-educated. White, affluent women are, that are well-educated. Who is the most frequently vegetarian or vegan consumer in the world? White, well-educated, affluent women. I'm just bringing you back to common sense. It's a consumption of all four food groups and exercise more than you eat. That's the bottom line. It's that simple. We've tried to move too far away from it. Final thing that I want to share with you is something that is maybe, as my 16-year-old would say, Dad, that's random. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently you have 16-year-olds. But it, it, it truly plays a role in where I assess Australia is today politically and the disconnect and the reason we need to really ramp up the Center for Rural Australia Studies is because the folks in the rural areas of Australia and the United States have been too quiet. I'm part of a group in the United States where we formed the All-American Beef Battalion six years ago because Bill Brody, a Vietnam veteran, came home and was treated exactly like your Vietnam veterans were when they came home. And he said, Trent, we're going to make sure that our kids coming home today from Afghanistan and Iraq are not treated like I was. So we formed the All-American Beef Battalion, and long story short, in the past six years, we have been there, and we have served a meal with a one-pound ribeye to 200,000 men and women returning from deployment. We've had tremendous, it's been the most humbling experience of my life. But we were asked to serve for the wounded warriors at the third annual George W. Bush Wounded Warrior Golf Outing, September 21st, 2012, for 600 young men and women, and not one of them had two arms, two legs. It was a tremendous honor to hang with these kids. And I was interviewing retired four-star General Jimmy Williams, Marine, United States Marine Corps. September 21st, 2012 was in the middle, in the heat of our presidential election, our last presidential election. So I'm asking retired four-star General Jimmy Williams about the sacrifice these kids make and what it's like being a family person today in the United States military. And he walked me through all of that. And then I had to be some sort of a regular media person, I guess, because I had one last question. General, it's been reported that if Barack Obama is reelected to the White House, there could be a cut to funding in the United States military up to 50%. What do you say about that? Fully expecting this guy, who's a career military man, to say the military is important, it's vital for the national defense, we must continue to have a strongly funded military. And instead, what he said, I never forget. Trent, look around here. These men and women risked their lives. All of these lost a limb. Most of them lost a comrade. 
70% of them lost their families. They've sacrificed for one reason, to preserve your freedoms as American citizens. And at the top of that list should be the freedom of speech. And if you don't like something that's happening in this country, they have preserved the right for you to stand up and be heard. You can even contact the president himself if that's what you're not happy about because they made the sacrifice. And it hit me again like a bullet between the eyes because I'm thinking, that's exactly why we're in the position that we're in, not only politically, but with the disconnect that we have between food producers and food consumers is because we have not exercised our right in the freedom of speech. And right here in Australia, not that I know that much about the political system, but you got a party that's not very big, but has been a very squeaky wheel. The Greens do not represent a lot of people, but yet they have political power because they don't shut up. <laughs> and we need to be more like them. We need to make sure that people understand that agriculture is vitally important to the future of Australia, not only for 23 million people, but just up the river, you've got 1.3 billion people that need what you have, food. And if we encourage more people to get involved in the business and we put more young people and young leaders through Marcus Oldham and educational opportunities and teach people that you too can be a first generation farmer because at the end of the day what we do is convert the God-given natural resources into the essentials of life. Food, fiber, pharmaceuticals, and fuel. And what we must always remember and what I remind everybody in my conversations is that it always has been and it always will be the individuals, not the institutions, that have made our countries to be great places to call home. Thank you for the opportunity to come and spend some time with us today, a tremendous meal. I know that we're going to have an opportunity for questions, and I look forward to interacting with all of you except Don later on.